Hey Art Nerds, so today we are going to do the field test for the March watercolor snacks. And that means we are going to be working with the core high chroma watercolors and no other colors. The Plumchester, and I can't find the 0.4 they sent me, so I subbed it out for 1.5, and I'll try to dig that 0.4 up. The Windsor and Newton watercolor, but I am gonna cut this sheet down because it's fairly big for a field test. And then finally, the Princeton watercolor uh, brushes. Now, uh, I watched the Jess Engel tutorial that's supposed to go with this unboxing, and she said a lot of super uh, really positive things about these brushes that I felt were kind of superlative and um, a little bit over the top considering they're synthetic brushes. So we're going to find out. We're going to find out together. So I am so excited to share this with you guys and I hope you guys are excited to watch. Okay, art friends, I am just about prepped to get going on this watercolor snacks field test. I went and grabbed my pink lead pencil because I definitely want to do my underdrawing with this and I also have the example illustration that Heidi created when working with this same set. So I highly recommend you check out that video by clicking here. I'm going to begin at the beginning with a sketch and I'm going to do that in time lapse. This illustration was really inspired by the colors included in this palette. There's this beautiful quinacridone magenta that just really makes me think of vibrant, beautiful Japanese plum blossoms. So that's kind of the theme of this illustration here. I also feel fairly confident in being able to mix the colors I need because this color range is very similar to the Tropical palette done by Prima Marketing. So I've already kind of played with these colors before. I do know that this came out before the Prima, Prima Marketing, so I can only assume that perhaps Tropicals was inspired by this palette or other high chroma palettes. But I'm fairly confident that using the color mixing skills I already have, I can get the majority of the colors that I'm going to need. The only color I'm kind of concerned about is the dark brown for her hair and that might be some trial and error but i do feel like the other colors are going to be fairly easy to mix and fairly easy to figure out now as heidi pointed out in their review of the included set these are not necessarily the colors one would think of when one's thinking of mixing colors these are not the sort of colors you would naturally gravitate to if you were putting together a mixing color set and i have five years of watercolor experience i paint just about every day i'm fairly competent in my color mixing and i'm still kind of concerned about these colors but i really think i'm gonna go ahead and just give it a shot and I am painting my girl Kara because I want all of you to take a moment and head on over to 7inchkara.com or 7inchkara.tumblr.com and read my beautiful webcomic. It's entirely in watercolor, so if you like watercolor, you're going to like at least the art for it. And um, it's a work in progress. It's something I'm working on every single day, always either writing or drawing or painting pages. So if you like comics and if you like watercolor, that's a great intersection. So I really wanna encourage you to head on over there and check out my work. So I have here the basic sketch. I'd gone ahead and subdivided the page and kind of used that to help me with the composition. Composition has always been <laughs> something I'm kind of weak at. And I tend to take a lot of like really easy, lazy shortcuts, especially for these sort of field tests. So it's not a great composition, but you guys can see that I did kind of lay down a compositional grid and then kind of work from there. Ideally, I would nudge her over a bit. So she's over on this third um, and probably had something more visually interesting here so I can always add some more plum flowers in. So the next step 
is going to be to tighten this sketch up into a more rendered sketch. So I have kind of the basic sketch down. I'm not going to ink this illustration until the end. And part of that is because I misplaced the 0.4 Plumchester. So I'm using a 1.5 and Plumchester is made for art snacks. So I figured this is a decent sub since I can't find what I'm actually looking for. But also I know if I ink this with this, it's going to feel too heavy. So what I want to do is I want to paint it first and then selectively ink parts to just add kind of the lowest amount of shadow. However, when I do um, colored lead illustrations, I need to stop and uh, before I tighten things up too much, erase all the stray lines so that they don't overwhelm the illustration. And that can be done it really simply. Um, this is a Pentel click erase, so like a very small white vinyl eraser or like a mono white vinyl eraser, the really fine ones are really great for getting in there and erasing um, just extemporaneous lines from tight areas. And that way we don't end up with too much visual clutter. And then once I get all of that done, I can go in and kind of tighten the details on everything else. So of course I'm gonna to wanna to erase these pink guidelines, for example. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase all those extra lines. And uh, then I'm gonna start tightening up this illustration so we can get ready to paint it. So my sketch is completed. Uh, this is the thumbnail. This is the resultant piece. Pretty happy, still conveys the same basic uh, feelings, the same tone. So for the rest of this piece, I'm going to need to find um, a sturdy surface to mount this to since this is cellulose-based watercolor paper and it's only 140 pound. Um, if it were 300 pound, I could probably work without stretching it or mounting it, but I'm gonna need to mount it just to prevent buckling especially because I do a lot of layers of watercolor. And from here on out, I'm going to be working with the core six high chroma watercolors. And then these three watercolor brushes, the Princeton uh, Velvet Touch Synthetics. Fortunately, I love working with rounds and I think these are two sizes that'll suit me really well, but I am gonna try to work this um, angled shader into it. Uh, just because they included it and I don't really use angled shaders normally. So now is a really good opportunity to kind of mix it up and do that. So I have here a piece of inexpensive masonite. This came from a broken frame and like the pack rat that I am, I save that sort of stuff because it's really good for these sort of little illustrations where you don't really want to adhere them to your desk for whatever reason. And I was looking for my blue masking tape, couldn't find any. And of course, the, no masking tape was included with the art snack, so I have to provide my own. So instead, I'm going to use some washi tape that was sent to me by a friend. And it is kind of a shame to use it for this. It is so cute, but it's also wide and it's a little tackier than the cheaper washi tapes. So I think it's gonna work really well. It's really cute washi tape though. And I'll flip that over and just butcher the tape because I have the hardest time in the world with these wide tapes. I love them. I think they're really cute, but like, 
<laughs> I have a really hard time with them. Oh, oh, it's meant to be separated. Oh, that's so cute. Wow. <sighs> that's actually a really cute idea. Dang it. But the theory works the same. I'm not doing this on the front because this is kind of a, almost a border to border illustration. And I, I feel like doing it on the front would just kind of detract. Oh, it doesn't want to stick. That is weird. I've used paper washi tape like this for a lot of my watercolor illustrations. It's kind of a nice low tack way to get my image faux stretch. So it's weird that it just like did not want to stretch. Because it's tacky enough. I wonder if there's something up with the paper. I've used Windsor & Newton's cellulose space watercolor paper before. And I'll link those videos here in the cards. And I don't dislike it. A lot of artists don't like it. There's been a lot of complaints about it to the point where Windsor & Newton has released a, and I use this for testing, but this is a cotton rag version of watercolor paper from them. And I look forward to being able to talk about that with you guys, but that wasn't included in this box. And I'm not 100% sure why, because a lot of these items aren't new items. They aren't innovative items or, I don't know. I don't have a lot of questions about, about this watercolor snacks box, but. Kind of hoping it will all gel for me mentally when we're doing our field test. All right, so I've adhered it. Hopefully it will stick and prevent it from buckling because it is, again, only 140 pound paper. It's not really heavy enough not to buckle. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I wanna apply a wash of this cobalt. It's either cobalt blue or cobalt teal. It's a really pretty color. It's a little bit opaque though. I don't care for it as a mixing color. What are we? Cobalt teal. I'm going to use that as a bit of a wash. And I'm just gonna apply it in the lid here rather than pulling out one of my daisy palettes. Or could even apply it to my Ink Essentials craft mat that I have here. So I'm gonna go get a fresh cup of water and I'll be right back. And just a little sneak preview, I have a more in-depth core watercolor thing or multiple things coming up in the near future. Okay, so I wanna make a wash and I'm using what they've included. This has a little divoted palette in the lid. So for a wash, I'm probably gonna want the larger pan. Always hesitant about applying, working straight from the tube. For me, I have such a hard time um, sort of controlling my mixes and all. Use a pipette to help make things easier. And we're gonna start light because you can always get darker, but you it's hard to get lighter. And I actually want the teal at pretty high saturation just because it is such a vibrant, pretty color. And I'm working with really high chroma, vibrant, pretty colors. And I don't, I usually kind of go a little muted. So. Now, the size brushes they included Considering they sent a nine by 12 pack are not really great. You want something a little bit larger than an eight and certainly for a flat like this, something a little bit larger than three eighths. It's gonna make doing a wash just painful, honestly just painful, but we're gonna do it. Nice thing about flats is that you can always turn them on their side like I'm doing and get in those details. And 
And one of the things I'm really concerned about is I am concerned about this wash drying and streaking before I've even had a chance to cover much surface area. So I'm not 100% sure what Art Snacks thinks we're going to be creating with our watercolor snacks or what sort of artists watercolor snacks assumes are subscribing to this box. But it's certainly not anybody who likes to work big because with brushes this size, that's just not really an option. And in general, you want to work with brushes that are a little bit larger than maybe what you would naturally go for. As you get used to watercolor, um, it'll just seem like a natural fit. But you generally want to work a little bit bigger than you would be comfortable with because that kind of helps prevent muddiness and getting too fussy and like that weird sort of streaky application and it keeps things a little fresher and a little looser. This is a really pretty color watered down. I do think I might want to go more saturated with it, but what I'm going to do, because I don't want weird, any additional weird streaking, I think I might get some weird streaking just by nature of working kind of with kind of a small brush for the project. Um, I think I'm going to let this dry fully and then decide whether or not I want to do another layer. And that'll be good because this is already a really light color, but watercolor tends to dry even lighter than it went down. I might like it really light. And you guys can see the paper, even though I did try to secure it, it is starting to buckle a little and cockle a little bit. And that is kind of what I figured would happen as soon as I started laying down a wash. Washes contain, by nature, a lot of water. And although I did watch the included tutorial, which was 15 minutes long and valued at $15, um, per individual valued at $15, um, I'm not going to talk too much about it. I will say that stretching your paper or securing your paper was not covered in the first introduction tutorial. And I do feel like if this box is aimed at possibly aspiring watercolor artists or learning watercolor artists who might be interested in a tutorial, that's information that's definitely valuable and important to cover. Fortunately, YouTube is full of free tutorials for just such a topic. So if you kind of missed out on that, you can go back and augment your education. And as I kind of figured from working directly from the two, I'm not really getting like an even mix. That's why I would normally work from like half pans or I would apply my paint to my uh, like my ink, my craft mat surface and then work from mixing from there. And that's probably the direction I'm going to take as I continue working on this piece. I just wanted to try utilizing the pan and every artist or most artists kind of find their own unique ways of handling things painting things rendering things so something I might have a problem with you guys might actually really like or it might be really conducive to how you work so just kind of take everything I say with a grain of salt and just assume that it's my preferences speaking Okay, so we are getting some cockling with the paper. <sighs> Hopefully it'll dry flat. I'm going to let it dry before I decide whether or not I want to add another layer. But that color is, I mean that teal color is a really beautiful teal color. Alright, so this has had a chance to dry. As you can see, there's a fair amount of cockling going on. Not too bad. It's not unsalvageable. It's not like it's all rippled, which is what you get with really cheap watercolor papers. It's just enough to, you know, be worth noting. I'm going to go ahead and remix the cobalt teal. And I'm going to apply, I think, another wash. 
And just like before, I'm gonna work in sections. And that way, actually, this should probably be darker. And actually, it might be more visually interesting if I left some patches not colored. Okay, so I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an all over wash of this and then mix it darker and uh, kind of explore maybe that patchier idea because that would kind of give it like a cloudy or like, you know, those high summer days where the sky has like kind of different tones to it like that. Although this color is kind of a very early spring robin's egg blue sort of sky blue color. Another thing you want to make sure you do that I find isn't often mentioned for beginner watercolor tutorials is make sure your hands are clean. Um, and I don't just mean like, you know, no visible dirt on them. I mean clean because the oils on our hands can create dead spots on the paper, which serve as sort of a resist for the paint we're trying to put down. So if you've ever tried watercoloring and you just found that, you know, there were areas that just really weren't taking the paint very well, it could be that the oils in your hands had created a bit of a resist effect. I think I did a better job mixing my paint this time. Now, something I really don't like about synthetic brushes, and it's true for these Velvet Touch brushes as well, is that they tend to just kind of drip water. If you like overload the brush, which I like to do with like squirrel hair or sable hair brushes, um, if you do that with a synthetic, it will just kind of drip on the paper. It releases kind of all the paint in one area rather than reserving some of the paint in the belly of the brush. So I like synthetics to an extent. Uh, they always kind of have a place in my work and in my studio, but they're not my favorite. And I'm a little bit disappointed that we weren't sent like one nicer brush than these, especially considering the cost of the box. Okay, so I am going to let this dry and then we'll kind of reevaluate the background. We're sort of building it up and thinking about it as we go along. I've given this a chance to dry overnight and I'm kind of taken away by the sedimentation or the granulation, I guess, of the cobalt teal. It's very pretty. And uh, I also let it dry in the palette overnight. And uh, I don't know, I just thought that was kind of interesting. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to start with the Quinn Magenta and I'm going to start painting some of these plum blossoms. And instead of putting a dot in the half pan, because I do want to control my application, I'll put it on my craft sheet. and mix it from there. And I think that'll give me a little bit more control than I seem to have. And we're still using the Princeton Velvet Touch brushes that were sent in the watercolor snacks. And they, the rounds are very drippy, or at least this round, which is an eight round, is very drippy. And I notice I'm dipping my brush more often than I normally would, and the reason is because it is so drippy, it pretty much just dumps all the paint on the paper immediately, which makes it kind of difficult to control. Now I know I am using synthetic brushes and that is kind of a trait for synthetic brushes. And I know you can also flag the hairs on your synthetics 
to have them hold water a little bit better than this. But I am judging this box as a whole and as it is without too much modification to make the products inside more usable. So while there are things I could do to sort of facilitate this, I'm not doing anything or I'm doing very little additional to make this box work. And that's because if these art snacks uh, subscription boxes are supposed to work as a coherent whole and you're supposed to be able to make something with each one, then, you know, it goes to show, or I rather, I would think it would, I think you can assume that these boxes are also intended at beginners who might not have a lot of materials and might not have the knowledge of how to sort of get things to work a little better than they've been designed to work. So I think it's important to show these materials without too many accommodations made. I did um, secure my paper and that's more for my own working convenience because I hate painting on Buckley paper and I find it hard to control. So I'm doing a very light layer of the Quinn Magenta. And that's because I'm going to build this color up into something a little more saturated. As this dries, I'm going to work a little bit more saturated. Some of these are going to be wet into wet. Some of them are going to be wet into dry which is going to kind of add an element of irregularity or chaos to it. So should maybe be a little more interesting, hopefully. For my personal taste, I find this velvet touch brush to be a little bit sharp and hard to control because it comes to such a fine point. although that would make it very useful for doing kind of thicker details with the paint. And for adding these sort of finer details where I'm sort of thinking and deliberating a little bit, I find the drippiness of the brush to be very frustrating. I am a big advocate of using synthetics for larger brush sizes since they are more affordable. Uh, I'm just really not impressed with the Velvet Touch brushes. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the centers of these cherry or these plum blossoms and the centers for plum blossoms tend to be a bright yellow. So we don't have a bright yellow. That's okay. Uh, we do have Quin gold and we do have green gold. So I'm sort of hoping we can mix our own yellow. I feel pretty confident that we can mix our own yellow. And something, if you're using the sort of included weld palette at the top, something I don't like, and it could just be me, is um, the, the welds are very shallow. So it's very easy for like 
your paint to kind of overfloweth their bounds. So win gold and then green gold. To be honest, I always kind of like these color mixing challenges, especially with nicer watercolors, because it's a really good opportunity for me to sort of learn a little bit more color theory and practice what I know. And I'm using the smaller size four Velvet Touch. And this one isn't really doing it for me either. The only one I could see myself consistently using in the future is gonna be that angled shader. And it's really just because like there's no belly to these synthetics. They don't hold the water very well. They're very drippy. I'm kind of constantly afraid I'm going to drip all over my the piece I'm working on. Okay. I think that's a good start, but it is very desaturated. So I'm going to go in with a little bit of Quinn Gold. In the hearts of these flowers. And something Heidi noticed when working with these, and you can check that video video by clicking the card earlier in this video, is that these reactivate really quickly. And I'm kind of noticing that too. And that's kind of unusual. It's not really the experience I've had before with like Quinn colors. Usually Quinacridones are very staining. Sort of surprised, I guess, by how much these Quins want to move. I'm going to tighten that a bit more after these dry. So the next thing I'm going to want to work on are the branches. And I think I can achieve kind of what I want with green gold and dioxine violet. Which sounds like a heck of a com combination, right? You can also use the inside, removing this as like a miniature butcher's tray. I know some people prefer to paint that way. There's definitely times when I also want to paint that way. So if this little weld palette doesn't really do it for you, you can kind of fake a portable butcher's tray and gain a little more mixing room. And I'm trying not to work in full concentration. Since green gold has a lot of shading capabilities, you can really get a lot of variation out of green gold. And I want to kind of take advantage of that. Unfortunately, dry over dry techniques with these velvet touch brushes are not going super well. And I'll grab a little bit of dioxine purple. This could potentially go super haywire. This is a really intense purple that can sometimes be really overwhelming, but it seems to be working really well in this instance.
So I've made about as much progress as I'm probably going to make on the flowers for now. The next thing I want to do is I want to attempt to mix a skin tone. And I feel like this is going to be kind of a challenge because um, I know I could use a very watered down version of pyrrole orange, but what I usually do to mix skin tones is I mix yellow ochre with some scarlet red. I think I'm going to do pyrrole orange, quin gold, and a little bit of uh, quin magenta. And I grabbed a scrap piece of paper to test it out with and it's actually completely different paper it's uh, inexpensive Canson bulk watercolor paper but it'll be enough for me to be able to tell whether or not I am successfully mixing what I'm trying to mix and I went ahead and I cleaned out our tray and I got a fresh cup of water so I'm kind of rolling with all new clean things right now which is nice I guess we'll start with the pyrrole orange and I'll swatch that for you guys so you guys can kind of see. I mean, yeah, you can call it a skin tone, but it's also sort of like Crayola peach. Um, grab a little bit of the Quinn gold. Wow, must be a lot of Quinn gold still on my brush. That's a little bit better. It's a little more nuanced. Grab a little bit of the Quinn magenta. It's looking about right. It's going to be hard for me to mix this darker though. This is like already a really light color. I usually work a lot more saturated than this. So I'm going to have to keep swatching as I mix in order to get my skin tone right. Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and do the shading on her eyes. And for that, I'm going to mix a tiny bit of dioxine violet and a tiny bit of the cobalt teal. And it kind of makes like a cerulean blue color, but not, not like a true cerulean blue. Let me, so like that, a little, like a dirty, <laughs> Cerulean blue basically, but I'm just kind of going for like a light shadow kind of color for her, the shading on her eyes. It's also like a little dirtier of a color than I wanted it to be. needs a lot more water mixed in. There we go, that's a lot better. I was also thinking about using that color on her dress since a white dress would look really pretty. So I'm gonna go ahead then and mix that color in one of these little shallow wells. I feel like the combination of using this metal uh, lid as a palette and then using these very drippy brushes is, does not make me a happy back. It makes me an antsy back. All right, I really like how the shading on her dress turned out. I'm going to 
kind of tighten it up a little bit in certain areas using the same dioxine violet cobalt teal mixture. Actually, I'm kind of surprised how nice a shadow color it makes. I didn't really see that coming. Yeah, that's honestly a nice color, kind of a nice diffused violet. And then mix up and attempt our first layer on the skin tone. I wanted to point out that the uh, sort of grippy texture that makes the Velvet Touch brushes have sort of this matte finish. Those of you who might be video game enthusiasts, especially retro video game enthusiasts or retro computer enthusiasts or retro electronics enthusiasts with an interest set in, let's say, the 80s, probably are familiar with this grippy material. This stuff turns to like glue in three years. It's sticky. It, I think it's probably latex based and it starts to rot, but I've had this on other products and I, ha I hate it after it started to rot and there's I can't figure out a way to strip it from the product so unfortunately I like to use my brushes until they give up the ghost and croak and I've had some of my brushes since high school this sort of coating basically prevents that from happening because I'm gonna have to throw it away as soon as it gets sticky you just can't really paint effectively if the brush is sticking to your hand In a way, I'm happy to see the innovation because I definitely do have the problem where my brushes start getting kind of wet because I'm kind of a sloppy painter and, uh, you know, harder to handle, harder to manipulate. And this helps with that. And it also kind of just helps with grip in general, maybe makes it slightly more ergonomic. But the fact that this is going to rot in a few years is kind of a problem. All right, so the skin tone actually looks pretty good. I am going to want to, after the skin tone dries, I'm gonna to wanna to apply, I think. Oh, hmm, cause I'm thinking about how Heidi did it. And I didn't really like how it started to lift off when Heidi did it. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save that for the end, um, sort of learn from Heidi's mistakes. So I'll let that skin tone dry. So I am quite pleased to see that the skin tone did actually work. Let's see if we can get some more layers out of it before we have to mix it darker. With these synthetics, sometimes I'm not 100% sure how they'll beh behave. Yeah, I'm gonna have to mix this darker. Now that's gonna get pain in the butt because I'm gonna have to color match. That's going to make things kind of tricky. So I'm going to do a little test. Rather than remixing the color, I'm going to step away for a little while and allow it to evaporate some. Sometimes with watercolor, the colors will actually separate out as it evaporates. I think you guys probably saw that in my Daniel Smith Essential 6 test and in my Cotman Field test. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens with core watercolors. So I return about an hour later. I'm gonna give that skin tone a nice thorough mixing. And it's a beautiful, warm, dry day out today. So some evaporation may have occurred. It's also kind of warm in my studio. So I'm sure that facilitated evaporation. So it is a little bit darker. Maybe not super contrasty, but certainly another layer of watercolor darker. 
guys can tell I'm really trying to avoid having to remix this color because I know I'm gonna I know I'm gonna botch it. Anytime I mix a color from more than or rather a skin tone, because you know, accuracy is important when it comes to skin tones. Anytime I mix a skin tone from more than two base colors, it usually tends to end with a lot of remixing. Although our plum blossoms are looking pretty good. All right, friends, it's been about 30 minutes. Gonna see if we've got some evaporation going in our favor. Actually, the smart thing to do would be to transfer some of the skin tone over to one of these smaller wells so that it could actually evaporate quicker and we can actually get a darker tone. And I am pretty sure that is not why the palette was designed that way, but I'll take it. It is kind of nice though, that um, even though I've complained about the design of the palette, it is kind of nice that Core includes that as an option in the design of their tins. I think their tins are really nice. Um, I like that you do have kind of like a butcher's tray option and also a weld palette option. Different artists paint differently, so I know there's people out there who probably love the wells for me the problem is they're too shallow and they're too close together and for me that just means every all my colors run together but i might be just working with too much water so this isn't as evaporated as i would like that's okay, we've got a solution in the works. I am now going to attempt to paint, to mix a brown and I'm a little scared. So, color theory tells us that if we take an orange, like pyrrole orange, for example, and we take um, ideally a blue, we don't have a blue that's really a good complement for this, so we're gonna have to take some purple, you mix the two together, and probably should have aired more on the orange than on the purple. Well, that's nice. Now we know how to get a hotter version of dioxine purple. This might be too red to give me a good brown. Actually, there's our brown. There's our brown. So there. Pyrrole orange plus dioxine purple. You can definitely get a brown. It's a very red brown. It's kind of a nice rich brown like I, I don't hate it. We'll use this as our starting point. I'm kind of impressed that I was able to get there really quickly. Oh, and then I remembered how much I really, really don't like these synthetic brushes when it just gooped a lot on the paper there. tell you these brushes are actually very frustrating to control and I think they're probably my least favorite part of this box I really am not a big Princeton brushes fan I own some I own the Neptunes I mean I own a f quite a few Princeton brushes and I own quite a few uh, Princeton synthetics but I certainly don't go to like Dick Blick or Jerry's and think I'm going to stock up on some Pr Princeton brushes. I even have a, um, it's like a model brush. It's got the Duralar handle. I'm trying to remember the name. It starts with a T. It's like Tesco or Tesla. It's not Tesla, obviously. Testers. I even have a tester synthetic brush that I think I got from like, mass drop or whatever or some slick deal 
and I like it a lot better. And it's not designed for watercolor painting at all. It's designed for painting models. And I think that's a better brush than these. And I sincerely believe there's somebody out there who likes these. So if you are that person, speak up. I wanna see how you're handling these brushes. I wanna see your art so I can know what I'm doing wrong. Other than like, not every art supply has to appeal to every artist. And it's not even like test up. Uh, like Princeton makes the worst watercolor brushes. I just like, it seemed like every Art Snacks when I was subscribed in 2016 and when I was subscribed in 2014 and doing the reviews, it seemed like every, every box included a Princeton box and they didn't really include any brushes by anybody else. And I just, I don't know, I realize that, you know, Art Snacks is probably not designed for someone like me who regularly reviews art supplies. I get that. Um, so I kind of thought for a while that, oh, it's designed for maybe like a beginning artist trying to build, put together a studio and they, they don't have a lot of experience. So they, you know, get to try a bunch of different art supplies and decide what you like. I really hate this brush. The control in this thing is terrible. But I don't think that's the case either. And I really kind of think the audience is just YouTube audience, uh, artists and YouTube unboxings, that sort of stuff. And if that's the case, that's really sad. And I know that's what I'm doing right here, right now, but that shouldn't be an in-target audience. It's like a dead end if that's your target audience. Is people who review things or unbox things because they're doing that to help other people. Well, theoretically, they're doing that to help other people find things that they're going to like. So if your end audience just reviews things, then you don't, that's it. That You don't have like anywhere else to go. So we were able to accomplish a brown. It's not even a bad brown. I used up all that I'd mixed. So I'm gonna have to remix, but it's not really a big deal. It's just two colors. We'll figure it out together. Um, I feel like I would have done a much better job. The color is a good color. Like the core watercolors, I'm really liking them. I'm impressed by like how easy it is for me to actually mix things that I want just using a little very basic color theory. So I'm really happy with the core watercolors. Um, again, high chroma would not be my recommendation for a beginner, but if you have been painting for a while and you're looking for like a fun way to kind of mix up your palette or mix up how you approach your color mixing and your color theory, this could be a really good option for you. And then the colors are just beautiful. Um, they're just good colors and they can be really fun to use just in general. So I have no real complaints about the core watercolors my complaints, even the paper, like I've used this paper before. I've done other illustrations on this kind of paper. I don't mind this paper. I know some artists don't care for it. I was surprised that Art Snacks opted to use a paper that Winsor & Newton has since released kind of um, a replacement for or an alternative to. That really surprised me. But this paper itself doesn't bother me. I don't have a problem with the excess sizing. It doesn't cause, I don't have the issues other artists seem to be having. And I mean, that's because I, might handle my watercolors differently. I don't know. I'm not claiming like, oh, I've got, I've got to figure it out. Just like we all handle our materials a little bit differently. So that's probably why I am not having trouble with it, but other people who are far more advanced artists than I am are having problems with it, right? But like these brushes, I just really don't like these brushes. So those of you who are a little more familiar with my channel, have been around for a little while, you guys have probably seen me do tests where I work with dye-based watercolor inks. And one of the big complaints that I have when I'm working with those sort of watercolors 
is that the colors tend or the skin tone tends to always be a little hot and uh, even though these are pigment based watercolors and I did mix the skin tone myself that's something I'm kind of noticing with the blend I opted to go with so before I do another shade on her hair I want to develop a skin shade and I want to do the shading on her cheeks so for her cheeks I'm gonna grab a little bit of pyro orange and a little bit of magenta oh look that looks like it's actually gonna make for a nice red yeah that's a pretty decent red and it is kind of ridiculous to admit this but I learned how to mix a nice medium of the road, middle of the road, red like that from using the Crayola educational watercolors, the mixing colors, because I've always had a nice red provided for me in the past. So sometimes doing these kind of crazy challenges can be a really good opportunity to kind of learn a new skill. So I'm going to let the original skin tone dry just a little bit and then I'll finish applying the red but that was actually incredibly easy and I'm kind of it's probably the subject matter if I was trying to do stuff with more blues I'd probably be pretty frustrated right now but as it stands I'm fairly pleased with how easy it is for me to mix the sort of colors I'm looking to get. Also, going to start mixing up. See if I can get it out enough that you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm going to start mixing up the shadow color for her skin, and I'm going to grab just a smidge of purple because this dioxine purple is really intense. A smidge of purple, and then a little bit of magenta aiming for kind of a red violet and that might be a little too strong Let's swatch that's about the color I want it's a little intense so I'll just drag it off into another palette well and mix it with a little bit of water so that's actually a really nice color sometimes it seems like dioxine or not yeah dioxine purple is a little too much and definitely sometimes using Quinn Magenta can be kind of intimidating. But I feel like some of the blends I've been able to get with these have just really been like nice colors, kind of fresh, um, good vibrancy. They haven't lost a lot of that kind of zing. I'm using a darker mix, in fact, of Dioxine Purple and Quinn Magenta on our Plum Blossoms. Now again, as kind of a color mixing primer, this isn't your easiest color mixing set. You do need some experience and some intuition to sort of figure out how to get from point A to point B. So if you were gonna use this as your daily driver, this could be really great if you paint a lot of florals and you might only need a couple of other colors just to kind of extend the range. But if you're painting a lot of figurative work, these colors might not be the easiest or the most intuitive And that red really cooled down the skin tone. I'm kind of surprised. And then once that dries, I'll start doing the skin shading. All 
right guys, so the base layers of skin tone have dried. I'm going to go ahead and grab some of that shadow color and water it down a fair bit since it's a little bit intense. And kind of judging by what I saw Heidi struggle with, I'm gonna learn from Heidi's mistakes because that's what friends are for, right? And I'm only going to put, I'm gonna start out only putting shadow color where it's really needed. And those of you who are frequent viewers know I have a little bit of a, of a problem with like over rendering. So hopefully showing some discretion will kind of help with that. The shadow color isn't bad either. Now I wouldn't try to do too many layers over it. That's one of the areas I saw Heidi having trouble with. Um, these paints seem to really lift up. Kind of like dye based. Just soften that a little because it's a little intense. And I should probably say thank you, Heidi, for troubleshooting this because you. And the piece Heidi made is beautiful, by the way. Like, it is a beautiful piece. But kind of benefiting from Heidi's experience and learning from how they handled these paints uh, is allowing me to kind of go in with more confidence. So I'm appreciative of the troubleshooting. I grab some of that red I mixed earlier. Kind of define the lip a little bit better and the cheeks. So I'm a little disappointed by how muted this red dries. I really thought it was going to be because you've got two really intense colors and they're they're not like complementary colors. They shouldn't neutralize one another, but they kind of do. All right, and then I'm gonna let this dry. So it's a little bit surprising to me how desaturated the red dried on her cheeks. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blend it out a little bit, let that dry, and then maybe go in with just a little bit of magenta. And that way it'll kind of echo what's going on in the, in the plum blossoms as I struggle for words, but everything else is looking pretty good. So my skin tone mi mixes have all dried. So I'm going to reconstitute one. Push that back so you guys can see what's going on. And the skin tone is otherwise great. I'm just darkening and darkening it a little bit because it is lacking in contrast. I also kind of want to push my luck and see how the shadow tone I mixed up sort of stands up to this abuse. And then we're also going to need to mix a dark brown. So we're going to revisit the pyrrole or orange and the dioxine violet. You need to grab a lot of orange because the violet tends to be really overwhelming. Swatch it so we can see what we're getting here. Wow, that's a pretty good color match for the original. I'm going to grab some more purple though. Let's see if I can't get it a little darker. Yep, looks like it. And I feel like it bears repeating. I know I'm a bit of a broken record, but I am really not liking kind of anything about these Velvet Touch brushes, at least the two rounds. Um, they are very pointed, almost like liners. And I personally always found liners to be kind of frustrating to use. And if they'd sent me liners, I would have just kind of, you know, like, crabbed about it a little bit, but at least I wouldn't be crabbing that the rounds handle like liners. I would be just crabbing about the fact that I don't care for liners. I 
And the reason I'm not big on these is the point is actually so long that it's kind of difficult to control and it tends to get kind of caught under itself as I'm as I'm applying paint, especially if I'm doing kind of a detailed area. It gets kind of frustrating. It's hard to do small details with this. So normally for this sort of pseudo lineless style, I would go in with like a very fine point round and use a darker variation of the color and kind of outline with that. And that's what I thought I was going to do with this, but I'm having so many control issues with this particular round, this four round, which is really more the size of a two round or a three round. I'm just going to kind of skip that step, I guess. Okay, so that's not quite as dark as I'd like. But I do also need to do Keras freckles, and I'm really concerned about that, considering what I just complained to you guys about. So I'm going to get the excess moisture off of this and just kind of hope for the best. And then I'm going to grab a little bit more of the dioxine purple and mix it in with our original pyrrole orange dioxine purple mix. And I actually really love that we get a really warm, rich brown by mixing these two colors. Although I've gained a little bit more experience mixing browns, browns are still not something I'm super confident in mixing, just because most watercolor sets include a couple of good browns to begin with. Yeah, she looks really weird without eyelashes or eyebrows. The tips on these Velvet Touch rounds are so long that if your hand shakes even a little it can significantly negatively affect what you're trying to ink it's not the fav my favorite way for drawing eyebrows on Kara but it is a completed way a somewhat successful way. All right, I'm grabbing a little bit of Quinn Magenta. I'm going to put that on her cheeks and on her lips just because I was kind of dissatisfied by how desaturated. Ugh, too much water. By how desaturated my original blush mix was. And let that dry. All right, so we have reached a moment of truth. I say A, because I feel like there's gonna be many more as we add the final tight details and I continue to not trust the Velvet Touch brush. Not the best eyes I've ever drawn, but also not the worst. <laughs> it was definitely making me feel a little anxious. My heart was racing. I guess excited or nervous <laughs> would be the, really the best terms for that. fix something and I ruined it. Isn't that how it goes? I guess 
I gotta leave it alone. Oh, I did actually sort of get used to the velvet touch as um, the piece progressed and I progressed. I still don't like it. Ooh. So I have some core out from this morning when we did her dress and it's gotten like goopy when I try to reconstitute it. It's not, not a good feel. It is a bad touch. that's an important consideration because a lot of artists will reconstitute their paints or um, sort of work from the same palette and just reconstitute it as they go along. So if you have paints that turn goopy and gluey really quickly, those are not paints that would really work for that sort of a palette. Although I do think it's probably mostly due to the cobalt teal that I used. Now I'm just trying to use a more concentrated version of the skin tone to kind of do that inking technique I told you about. Then just a little bit of the skin shadow color way down here. All right, I'm gonna let that draw. Oh, I always say that and then I'm like, well, wait, I'm gonna do one more area. But I do wanna do a little more cast shadow on our arms that are holding the flower. All right, I'm gonna give all of that a chance to dry. So I am almost finished with this and I'm really close to being finished with using the watercolor snacks ingredients. I am gonna introduce a little bit of opaque white since I enjoy using that. Oh, see, you guys see how drippy this stuff is? Or rather, you see how drippy these synthetic brushes are? Although, you know, I'm sure there's somebody watching this who, I don't know, like the light clicked on for them and they're like, yep, that's the one. That's what I'm looking for. I wanted loose watercolor techniques or loose watercolor effects. That'll do it. But I'm probably going to switch over. Um, I think I will, I hesitate to ink this because it's actually pretty tight and I have a feeling I'm gonna wreck it. So I think I'm gonna do just really light kind of suggestive inks with this. Nothing too developed, nothing with the intention of adding too much black because we have all these really nice vibrant colors and then we have a black fine liner, which just I feel like kind of will deaden the effect But something else I was gonna point out is that I know not every watercolor artist uses opaque whites. Um, I know a lot, I know we're really supposed to be using in general the white of the page. But I feel like this is kind of a non-traditional set anyway. So it's sort of like, it would have been nice if they had included an opaque white. But I honestly, don't fault anybody for that one because that's just more of like my personal preference than an actual quality or frustration issue. So I'm just using kind of a more saturated version of the cobalt teal just to add some, no, don't drip on there some details and some interest to the paper because it's just kind of a little bit boring. 
static. That's the word I want. It's just kind of static. Just given the nature of what I'm doing, I should have done this probably earlier. You add it, you amend it when you notice it. And the paper kind of kipping up is certainly not making this an easier task. I feel like the combination of these drippy synthetics and this paper kipping up. Let's not make for an easy painting experience. And it's certainly a little detrimental to the amount of fun I'm having. I do kind of wish there's so many different types of watercolor artists. I do kind of wish Art Snacks with, was clearer about what watercolor artists they're aiming for. I kind of feel like it's an illustrator. So things, cause like including like their Plum Chester fine liner, which is their brand. So they're probably trying to move stock, but like that's not necessarily something you would send to somebody who has kind of a more traditional watercolor background. That's something you would send to someone doing urban sketching or illustration or heaven forbid cartooning and comics. And I don't know, it's just always imp important to me to think about like who the end user is who's the intended audience, and that could be because I'm a comic artist. So, you know, that's a consideration for me in the works that I make. But I, I feel like as the years have progressed, I can't tell who their audience is anymore. I should also mention to you guys, because this has been a problem a few times for me, that Art Snacks is subscription auto renews you can't just go onto the site and like pause your account your options are to at least as of now your options are to delete your account or you can contact their support and ask you know ask them about pausing your account now you're gonna get if you don't you know go in and do something about it before the next subscription box rolls around which would be right about now is when they're charging for the next subscription box. So it can come out in June, I believe. Then, you know, you're going to go ahead and be charged. And there is a window for you to be like, hey, I don't really want this box. Please don't send it to me and you'll get a refund. But if you're not watching your email, you might not be aware that that, that happened. Now I'm, oh, I see it reactivated that pink by like a lot, dang. I'm not really a big fan of those sort of auto renew subscription services when you're paying on a month by month basis. I kind of feel like there's a lot of opportunity for that to, to kind of falter in favor of the company making the money. And uh, Artsnacks actually uses a third party. I think it's Plesso, Plesso, P-L-A-S-S-O to handle these transactions. So I'm just bringing this up because if you are purchasing this, if you're watching this video thinking to purchase this as a gift, or if you're watching this video thinking about purchasing this for yourself or requesting this as a gift, I feel like this is really important information to be aware of that isn't necessarily mentioned in a lot of the review videos. So that's just a heads up. It will auto charge you for the next month and then you get to contact Art Snacks and let them know whatever it is you're gonna let them know. And my other concern is if you delete your account, you might not have access to the tutorials you actually paid for because um, the way they distribute this is um, they use YouTube and they use an unlisted setting and then they put that on their site 
And if you don't, if that isn't showing up when you log in for some reason, I had to contact support about that as well. Um, then they will send you a link and just ask you not to share it with people. So I kind of feel like there's better systems for distributing a tutorial you've paid for. They've done stuff with Skillshare before. Um, I'm not really sure how that worked out for them. I was kind of surprised to see that this wasn't a Skillshare tutorial course. Maybe they don't have a deal with Skillshare anymore. I don't know. But I'm not really a big fan of the current system. All right, so we added that blue and it's actually reactivated um, some of the, the olive green, which is kind of, it's surprising and it's not surprising. Uh, the olive green wasn't applied that thickly. So I'm a little surprised that it reactivated because I usually only have reactivation problems when it's applied thickly and then I put a lot of water on it. Um, it could be all of the sizing on this paper. It has kind of a, um, almost like a soapy texture, which it doesn't bother me that much. And I kind of like that it's bleeding, but it might bother you. It's a your mileage may vary sort of, sort of situation. So I'm going to let this dry all the way. And then I'm going to decide whether or not I want to use, like I said, not the plum tester that came with it, which would be the point for, um, sort of, uh, I keep wanting to say dead line weight tip, but it's a, it's a set line weight. It's a 0.4 millimeter tip. Instead, I'm going to use the 1.5, which is a brush tip, same pigment ink, almost identical bodies, not too much different other than it's a brush tip. Okay, so before I start outlining with the Plum Chester, I am going to add some white details with an opaque white. This is Dr. P.H. Martin's Bleed Proof White. It is my opaque white of choice for right now because I happen to have a pretty full bottle. I also really like Copic Opaque White and I really like white gouache. All of them are fairly easy to handle and most of them handle almost identically. You're gonna want to add a little water to it. It does get kind of dried out. Now I'm just going to use this to add some sparing details. I always think adding the shine dots to eyes really helps the character kind of come to life a little bit more. That's when it really starts to spring to life. And I don't want to use too much because this isn't a box ingredient and I don't want it to sort of steal the focus. And I'm mostly just using it to kind of define some of the forms that may have gotten lost and to add some contrast back into the image. And finally, I'm going to use the Plum Chester Fine Liner to kind of tighten up a few details. Um, I'm going to try to use it really sparingly because I feel like adding a lot of black to this illustration is just going to kind of kill it. This particular Plumchester brush pen has a compressed fiber nib, which is, I've used a lot of brush pens in my time and I've reviewed a lot of brush pens in my time. And I gotta say the compressed fiber nibs are my least favorite ones to work with. They tend to get ratty really fast. They tend to get mushy and lose their point. And it's pretty comparable to the compressed fiber nib on pit pens or on, um, microns, the brush tip microns. I vastly prefer brush pins with the sort of spongy foam rubber. Those tend to hold their point and stay resilient and have a lot of spring and bounce with these. Even if you're being very delicate as I'm being here, um, they start to get mushy fast and lose their point. And uh, for me, that's when they're not really useful anymore. I'm sure some people are able to utilize that and may even prefer it slightly broken in. I'm 
I'm trying to have a very light hand with it because I do want to pull some really fine details with it. Now, again, for disclosure, this is not the Plum Chester that was sent in the watercolor snacks. That was a 0.4 um, single line width Plum Chester fine liner. So I did do a substitution, but I have a feeling one of my cats stole the other. And it's probably, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. <sighs> it's probably under a table somewhere because I have no idea where it is. It's, it's disappeared. So rather than completely skipping this stage, which might have been for the best, I uh, made a substitution, which might not have been the best choice. Now, for those of you who don't know, Plum Chester is Art Snacks line of art supplies, and I'm so far it's mostly fine liners of various sizes, brush pen like this one, and some sketchbooks. And none of them really strike me as being any sort of innovative or exciting or different. So I haven't really committed any time or energy to reviewing them. And I don't necessarily plan on it either because there's only so much you can say about fine liners. They all tend to perform kind of the same after a while. They are pigment based fine liners. So that means they are waterproof and alcohol marker safe. But I don't think they are actually any less expensive than Copic uh, multi liners or uh, Sakura microns or any of the other fine liners that have been on the market for a while so I really don't have any reason to recommend them. I feel like they might mostly be just an affordable thing that Art Snacks can throw into their boxes to kind of round out the price since they set the MSRP for these and they're the sole distributor of them they can claim they're four dollars a pop and who's gonna say boo? Well, people like me, but you know. And they don't perform, you know, they're not terrible performers. They're not worse than any other brush pens or fine liners on the market. There's just other brush pens and fine liners on the market that cost less, are easier to get a hold of, and some of them perform better. Or cost more, are made of aluminum, and are much nicer, and are intended to be refillable and can last for just about forever. But I didn't order this box just to carp on what they chose to include. That really wasn't my intention. I was really excited about this box. I know my unboxing, um, some people felt like that was harsh and that was just honest disappointment. I had various reasons to be disappointed from, you know, them separating my payment information from my mailing in information so that they couldn't even pull up my receipt, I had to dig one up and forward it to them to um, the box coming like a month late after everybody had already unboxed theirs and like the surprise was spoiled and like three of my friends were like, hey, did you get your box yet? Because everyone else did. That'll certainly leave kind of a sour, sour taste in a customer's mouth. I will say though that the, the employees I dealt with were very polite. Um, and it did get handled. And then when I saw, because I'd actually gone out of my way to keep myself from getting spoiled on what was going to be in the box, which meant not checking Instagram for about a month because everyone else got theirs before I did. I was just honestly, that was my honest reaction. I was honestly just kind of disappointed. I know what the materials cost. These are materials I use all the time in my work, so I'm really familiar with them. And it just didn't really seem like a fair value to me. And I was just hoping to see something really new and really innovative. And there was nothing at all new in the box. And that was kind of the biggest disappointment of all because I do review a lot of watercolor supplies and I did just go to Japan. So I got to kind of see 
a lot of the stationary supplies before we get a hold of them over here in the states. They 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 tend to be the innovators for um, like stationary and certain types of art supplies. So I guess I was just really hoping to see something like what I'd seen in Japan or just something that hasn't been on the market for several years. And I guess the point of watercolor snacks isn't to like introduce people to new products, which was kind of, I thought, originally the point for art snacks. And it doesn't seem like the point is um, to kind of provide beginner watercolor supplies either. And I also kind of felt like I got bait and switched on the site because I signed up really early on before they announced who their illustrator was. And not that I not that I have a problem with their illustrator, but like I, I was on board really early before there was even what felt like a lot of focus for this box. And that was kind of after I swore I wasn't gonna buy any more art snack stuff. The fact that it was watercolor got me so excited because they'd sent out a survey early last year and I was one of the people who asked for a watercolor box. And you know, they have a lettering box and I feel like the lettering box is more focused on the end consumer than the watercolor box is. This kind of felt like, I don't know, let's include watercolor products from our partners. The end. And I want more curation than that if I'm gonna pay someone else to curate a box for me. And I used to really like art snacks. Um, I did a whole year where I did comparative reviews between art snacks and sketchbox and sometimes i did scrawler box and art snacks usually won. I, I usually really liked what was in their boxes and i usually felt like it was really a fair value and a fair amount of novelty and a fair amount of research and for the watercolor box i just was expecting to feel like i was just expecting to, to be excited um and then like two weeks ago, Core revealed that they're doing um, solid half pans. So that could have been a cool like preview thing. And then Derwent announced that they're doing um, intense watercolor half pans. That would have been a really cool thing. And then there's also just like all of these kind of Japanese art supplies that we never get over here or um, they could have done some watercolor brush pins that, I mean, they sent out, um, I think Windsor and Newton watercolor markers in 2016, and I'm sure they've sent them out. Oh, and in 2014, I'm sure they've sent them out since, but like there are other types of watercolor markers on the market. So it would be cool to like see something like that or after I opened this box and was kind of disappointed, I was like, okay, well maybe the artist curated, the, the artist who's doing Just Single, the artist who's doing the tutorials, maybe she picked these materials because she just loves them. And then I checked out the first tutorial and it really didn't seem to be the case. It didn't, it seemed like those materials were fairly new to her. So I was kind of frustrated by that because I kind of, my like my thought was like okay if they're not being innovative then they're doing based on artist recs and that's kind of cool too and we're going to get an explanation for why the artist loves what they love and why they included it in the box and i mean you know i do reviews and i do recs so i i enjoy seeing what other people recommend and knowing why they like it and seeing it in the context of their work because watercolor artists illustrators, comic artists, we all work kind of differently. We all have kind of our own methods for doing things. And I love other people's process and I love other people's favorite materials and knowing why they like it and how they use it in a way that makes their work really shine. So I was kind of disappointed that that was also not the direction Art Snacks with went. And I realized that like by saying all of these things publicly, I'm just giving them free ideas if they so choose to pursue them and I'm not super into that idea but you know if it makes a better end product then at least some people will benefit from it. So the individual products in this box uh, 
the inclusion of a fine liner was kind of like, because uh, that kind of moves out of the line of like traditional watercolor and into illustration, which is fine. As you guys know, I love illustration. I just, I just feel like this box is an identity crisis. And I feel like the choices are kind of, I don't know, just all over the place. Like why Windsor Newton has basically replaced this paper. Why would you send me a pack of nine and a half, nine by 12? And why would you send me three synthetic brushes when there's so many cool natural hair brushes and you've sent natural hair brushes in the past. So I know it's not that kind of like an ethical concern in that regard. So like, why send me three synthetics now? And then there was also just like a lot of stuff that I feel like this box would have benefited from, would have made it a more usable box, um, like a smaller size paper. Um, so that, cause they sent this huge box, you guys saw that. And the only reason they sent that huge box is because the paper was huge. Or like maybe more than just a 0.4 milliliter pen, they could have included that and that would have been well within their cost to do so. Cause 0.4 is really limiting. Or like included a water brush cause they've done water brushes before cause they do stuff with Kurotake sometimes. I don't know. Every time I look at one of their specialty boxes, I always have more questions than I have answers. And I have a terrible confession. So you guys know how I was talking about how it will auto renew your subscription and auto charge you. And you only find out when you get the receipt. I guess I'm going to be looking at the summer box. Um, I did contact them and they did offer to refund me. And I actually opted to take the summer box because I'd already kind of like made it up in my mind, like, okay, fine, I'll take a look at it and see if they've improved. So and guess what that my mom had given me like a six month subscription i think or maybe it was a one year subscription to art snacks last year no 2016 and um she doesn't check her email very often and they auto renewed for her and i had to get that handled because there's no good halt my subscription or cancel my subscription option on the site it just offers to delete your account and I don't know if that actually deletes your account because I've had an account with them for several for several years now because I've been a subscriber off and on. So I guess you guys are going to be seeing the summer box for me too. So if you didn't enjoy this, I'm sorry. All right, so I think we are finished. I do like how the finished piece turned out. I'm a little disappointed with the red I was able to mix that was way more desaturated than I thought it was going to be. But the high chroma colors are really fun. And if you know color theory, you should be able to get most of the colors you're going to want from this. The only downside to that are there are no true blues. There is cobalt teal, but that's not going to get more blue. You know what I mean? So as like a mixing set, I can't recommend this. There's no blues. There's no true yellow. There's just queen gold. I mean, it's not designed to be a mixing set either. It's designed to be high intensity colors that you can add to your existing sets to kind of get a wider range of bright colors. I did find there was a little bit of lifting, not as much as I'd been warned about. Um, and I think that's probably the paper because you guys know I've painted with core watercolors a few times in the past on this channel. And they're generally really good performers. Golden makes nice watercolors. The Windsor and Newton paper is a cellulose based paper. They have since introduced a cotton rag paper. So if you don't like the paper in this box, Windsor and Newton does have a cotton rag option. However, if you're looking for some alternatives to the things included in this box, if you're looking to build a watercolor uh, product collection or have watercolors you enjoy, I do actually talk about dupes or what I would have included in the box in my ideal perfect world um, in our overview video where I'm also demonstrating these, pro these products. I really sincerely feel like Art Snacks, especially with watercolor snacks, is having a bit of an identity crisis. And um, 
you know, are they trying to appeal to um, an intermediate watercolor artist? Are they trying to appeal to like a traditional watercolor artist where you use the white of the paper as your final white and you don't ink things? Are they trying to appeal to the sort of people who do those like very loose floral illustrations? Because the high chroma set is perfect for those people. Um, just the kind of colors they would enjoy. I mean, they're beautiful colors anyway, but like as soon as I saw this set, I was like, big, loose, beautiful floral roses. Um, are they trying to appeal to a beginner watercolor who doesn't have much in terms of supplies? Are they trying to appeal to just like a general art enthusiast the way maybe their art snacks, regular boxes were? I don't, are they trying to appeal to YouTubers like myself who will spend money to look at the stuff on camera and then tell people about it and basically do their marketing for them, good, bad, or indifferent. Any publicity is still good free publicity. Like is that, what is Art Snacks game with the watercolor box? What is their intentions? Um, I felt like watching the tutorial that they'd paid for, I was still confused because I thought it was going to be not that I necessarily was looking for this, but I thought it was going to be, since it's a tutorial, basic watercolor techniques. And she did talk about a couple and she did do a demonstration. It was very enjoyable to watch, but it wasn't anything that isn't already very available on YouTube. So I can't recommend paying to gain access to that. And she didn't seem to be super familiar with these materials so you're not paying for an artist's like inside scoop i've been using these materials since they came out these are all the cool tips tricks and things you can do with them it wasn't like that either so i really really hope art snacks figures out has a better box for summer especially because either june or july is world watercolor month i want to say it's july i'm going to double check that July is World Watercolor Month, so that's a summer month. Um, I really hope that for World Watercolor Month they knock it out of the park because that's going to be a huge missed opportunity. If not, people are going to be using that hashtag. People are going to be talking about watercolor. People who don't normally give the time of day to watercolor are going to suddenly remember that they kind of want to learn how to do it. Um, really step up your game for summer, guys, because that's, that's the time when people want to do watercolor. If I wasn't in for a penny, in for a pound, I would not, I would not continue my subscription to this box, not as someone who does this on camera and certainly not as somebody who paints watercolor comic pages as part of her living. Um, I did think that the core watercolors, I liked the quality of those, but I've used those before. And I was just really not into the Velvet Touch brushes, especially the rounds. I found that they just really drop water all over the place. I'm not a fan of the matte finish because this tends to turn to glue in a few years. I'm not a fan of synthetics to begin with, so I am very biased. However, I did kind of like the flat. I still don't like the finish on it. I want to find a way to strip that off because it's going to it's gonna rot and become a glue mess in a few years. But I don't normally buy flats for myself. I buy rounds, so it's always nice to get like flats and angled shaders because they are useful. I just don't have a lot of them. And I find that in for synthetics, flats and shaders and and uh, mops, that sort of stuff tends to be like the best case for me. That in like huge brushes, like size 10 and up. So I know this is not a super high note. I was able to make a piece that I kind of like. I was able to learn some new things. I was able to play around with some techniques, but I can't necessarily recommend the Watercolor Snacks subscription tier to any of my watercolor friends. And I can't really recommend it to any of my art friends because I could literally cobble together a good intermediate watercolor set for about a hundred bucks. And this is like, what, $80? So that's only $20 shy. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much for bearing with me and enduring my complaints and being chill and just kind of being like, well, that's Becca. I appreciate your, your, <laughs> going to clean that off. I appreciate your patience with me and I hope you guys enjoyed this. Carping or not, I hope you guys enjoyed this and I hope I will see you guys in summer. But also in some of my other watercolor reviews, um, a lot of those have a more positive slant because 
I tend to be, I, I tend to know what I'm getting myself <laughs> into. And I tend to um, review things I think you guys might like. But some of them are just intended to be kind of funny. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for more watercolor tutorials, check out some more of my videos here on this channel or head on over to natitude.blogspot.com and check out my watercolor basic series. If you heard the word comic and you liked what you heard, you check out my intro to comic craft series also at natitude.blogspot.com and check out my watercolor web comic, Seven Inch Kara at seveninchkara.com and seveninchkara.tumblr.com. If you're interested in some of the prior videos in the watercolor snacks series, um, I will have them linked in the end cap and down in the description below. And I hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you again really soon. And thank you guys so much for watching. Bye guys. Hey arty friends. Today we are putting the spring watercolor snacks to the test. I'm going to create this adorable springtime illustration play with core watercolor paints and use the Princeton Velvet Touch brushes for all of my painting needs. If you guys are interested in seeing how this box performs under a real life painting situation, keep watching.